human beings are obviously something special. I mean, there's just something that sets us apart, makes us distinct from the rest of the animal kingdom. Now, the general consensus revolves around our unique level of consciousness. Humans have this distinct level of self-consciousness that a lot of animals don't even come close to replicating. I mean, there aren't any dolphin philosophers, probably. Now, this level of consciousness ties directly into a human's free will. We are more than just our base instincts. We can do whatever we want, whenever we want. We have the ability to choose. Or do we? <laughs> no, no, I can't use that. Now, the issue of free will is a deep philosophical conundrum that pervades the minds of many great thinkers in history. Some religions especially take free will into account. After all, what you do on Earth affects where you'll end up in the afterlife. Not to worry though, you can change your path at any time. You can make whatever choices you need to. But do you really have that freedom? We have to think about the scientific implications of free will. Let's work backwards and you'll see what I mean. Okay, so we can change our actions. Well, doing an action originates in your thoughts. Physically, that means we're changing our brain somehow. If our thoughts are merely neurons firing, then we change the very biochemistry of our brain simply from free will. The very neurotransmitters in our brain like dopamine and glutamate are rerouted, diverted simply because we tell them to? Well, our universe follows something called causality. Cause and effect. There has to be some cause. Now, if our brains really alter their neurological mechanisms, then there has to be some physical push for them to do so. Some other molecules have to put on some force on the neurotransmitters. Another molecule send those molecules, another molecule send those, going on and on, back in time, until your brain was a single neuron. Now, nowhere in that chain were you as an individual involved. Things happened as the laws of physics dictated, not because you made some choice. Now, this is the concept behind determinism. That is, everything is determined. The past is fixed, and so therefore is the future. Human beings don't really like this mode of thinking because it leaves a lot of things unexplained. Like, why do we feel we have free will? Is it somehow tied to consciousness? What even is consciousness? Now, these are all questions that people have debating since pretty much the dawn of debate, and they're all pretty deep philosophically charged. But let's focus on the science of it for now. Or well, debatably, science is a philosophy. And let's start with that feeling of free will, that feeling of being able to actually make a choice. Interestingly enough, we tested how that feeling actually correlates to your choices. In a famous study, people were hooked up to an EEG, which could read their brain waves. They were then placed in front of a button, and they were told they could hit the button whenever they wanted to. As expected, people hit the button, right? And nothing happened. Nothing yet. However, in an adaptation of that study, something very interesting was happening in the background. You see, a computer was recording all of their brain waves, and so the computer knew and analyzed what their brain looked like before, during, and after the button press. Eventually, the computer was able to learn enough about the participants and was able to actually predict ahead of time when they would press the button. Now, it was at this point when the researchers and the participants noticed something a little strange. Now, the computer was able to actually predict their choices ahead of when they consciously made their choices. You see, their subconscious had already made the choice for them. That feeling of choice, it's your brain lying to you. You don't have control over anything. You didn't even choose to click this video. Something made that decision, tricked you into thinking that you made that decision, and you're just along for the ride. Now, there is a small, tiny little wrench thrown into the hall causality framework. A wrench on the atomic seal, actually, quantum physics. You see, quantum physics kind of took the rules that we had learned in the 20th century and before and broke them to pieces along with our main idea of causality and certain physical extrapolation that we made from those ground rules that we had set. In the year 1814, Pierre-Simon Laplace made a claim now better known as Laplace's demon. 
we may regard the present state of the universe as the effect of its past and the cause of its future. An intellect which at a certain moment would know all forces that set nature in motion, and all positions of all items of which nature is composed. If this intellect were also vast enough to submit this data to analysis, it would embrace in a single formula the movements of the greatest bodies of the universe and those of the tiniest atom. For such an intellect, nothing would be uncertain, and the future, just like the past, would be present before its eyes. That is, if we could take a snapshot of the universe, if we knew exactly the position and velocity of every single particle in the universe, and we knew all the forces that guided those particles, we could then compute the universe's future. Now, that was 1814. Uh, the universe has unfortunately decided to be very inconsiderate and very inconvenient for us and just a little, little bit more complicated. Now, the same exact experiment and same exact setup can give seemingly random results. Why? We have a couple of different theories, or rather, interpretations. The most popular interpretation, the Copenhagen interpretation, essentially says that the universe is inherently random, not deterministic, and there's nothing we can do about it. The Many Worlds interpretation claims that for each seemingly random event, the universe just straight up splits in two, two different alternate timelines, each of which house one of the two possible outcomes from that event. Now, we can't really choose which outcome we get, so in effect, it's pretty much the same. There are also hidden variable theories, which claim that there is some hidden variable which causes these random events to actually unfold in a pretty deterministic way. Now, there are tons and tons of more quantum theories, but they all mostly have one thing in common. Quantum theory generally does not care about what you think. It does not care about free will or what a human brain might do compared to the rest of the universe. We probably can't change how the laws of physics work by just thinking really, really hard. So free will still doesn't exist. Now that's hard determinism. Now there are some problems with believing hard determinism. For instance, this means that human actions are all completely blameless. I mean, how could you be blamed for doing something when you were always meant to do it and when you couldn't possibly not do it? This also means accountability is a thing of the past. So, I mean, is this the world we have to live in? Where justice and accountability are no longer, you know, relevant? That's where other forms of thinking can come in handy. You know, wouldn't it be great if free will and determinism, two things we really, really feel exist, could somehow work together? Could somehow become compatible? Compatibilism, yes, that's the actual name, it's pretty on the nose is a framework which aims to combine both free will and determinism. Also known as soft determinism, the philosophy works by taking the definition of free will and slowly pushing it off the table. You see, we're moving the goalposts. David Hume, for example, defined a free action as one that is internally caused. That is, if you act accordingly with your personal choices, will, and personality, then the action is free. If you are externally threatened or otherwise constrained, then the action is not free. Now, a common objection to this definition is that personality and choices are commonly affected by how we grew up and the environment we live in. Culture affects our choice. I mean, we didn't choose the circumstances into which we are born, so how can any choices born of our birth environment be free? Arthur Schopenhauer's response to this criticism was a famous quote, man can do what he wills, but he cannot will what he wills. That is, so what if your motive's determined? If you act in accordance with it and you aren't constrained, then it's still effectively a free action. It's as close as we can get, and we can treat it as such in our justice system and in our everyday life. Now, there are many more interpretations to the whole free will determinism paradox, uh, including this simplified Punnett square and this headache of a taxonomic graph. 
by the way, if you're wondering why I didn't talk about libertarians, it's because that philosophy only deserves to be made fun of. Not to be confused with political libertarians, who need to be made fun of for different reasons. Then again, there are only so many minutes to this video, and I do have a couple of others in the works. So stay tuned, like and subscribe, hit that bell, give me words of encouragement and a hug if you ever see me in public, and let me know what you think in the comments below. Free will? Or is every choice we make not really a choice, and agency ultimately meaningless? Or is everything determined, but free will still meaningful in this day and age? I'm looking forward to reading y'all's response, and in the meantime, see ya!